Come with us on a journey, a journey to a place where information is unlocked, knowledge is gained, and the exchange of experiences welcome. This is the Knowledge Exchange, presented by Lakeland Community College. So uh, a little bit about the Wisdom Collaborative. Um, so I'm the board chair of a nonprofit organization. We started out with an idea about five years ago and our first meetings were actually here in H building at Lakeland. So we invited a bunch of thought leaders and uh, community business people and you know, just everyday people from walks of life that maybe are retired as well that are looking to get active in solving community solutions. So uh, from that, we came down to uh, a seven person board and we have four general members. And I know I'm not uh, bringing any news to the room when I say COVID hit and that kind of knocked us off our rails a bit, but we were pursuant, we stayed active. A year ago, uh, this past August, we received our 501c3 nonprofit status and uh, the story continues to evolve. So um, our mission statement is, is that we're, we engage individuals 50 years of age and older in solutions focused activities that address issues impacting Lake County. And we work with a number of other nonprofits. Uh, Carrie Dotson, who's the executive director of Lifeline, serves on one of our committee. Rick Penny, uh, in charge of the IT department here at Lakeland, serves on uh, our initiative that we started about a year ago called Digital Inclusion, and I'll get a little bit into that after I get through the elderly fraud and scams. Uh, so we have a lot of great people that work tirelessly and high energy to bring resolve to some of the issues impacting Lake County, and also to try to bring a resource to individuals where uh, maybe law enforcement might not have the answer, um, you know, parishes can only do so much. You know, today it's hard times in a lot of different ways uh, and they have to prioritize things. So sometimes you might not feel that you're a priority. So somewhere in that pecking order of the to-do list, we try to find a fit for uh, any individuals uh, that are having some challenges, primarily 50 and over, older, but that doesn't mean if you have a son or daughter that has been impacted by one of these unfortunate circumstances, we won't provide some resource to them as well. Uh, so I just want to ask the room a little bit. Has anybody been a victim of any type of scam or fraud? Two. Not that I'm aware of. Okay. <laughs> I was big this year. Okay, would you mind sharing that? Yes. So um, my garage door opener broke. Um, and so I looked, Google search the you know yellow pages as they come up on, on Google, um, and I I always prefer to use you know what you think like small business instead of a big chain right to support Lake County. So I picked one. It was called Ohio Door, listed on the the uh, website, um, and I called them and. He sent someone else out, so they contract out, like it's such a big mess. So you call one place and then they say they contract, see who can come out. Right. They came out within a couple of hours because I couldn't get the garage door open to come to work. Right. Um, oh my goodness. So the guy that came in said, yeah, we can get this done um, right away today. Uh, I have no knowledge about garage doors. Right, most of us don't. Right, and I always feel like I'm doing something smart if I'm getting my information from a business under the business pages. Right. Okay. So, anywho, I got I got taken for um, more than double what the actual price would have been. Um, I could have had everything replaced, my entire garage door, the opener, everything for what I paid for something that really would have only cost me a couple hundred dollars. Did they fix the problem? So he charged me in order to have them come out. He's the one that took advantage. Um, and then they call the actual legitimate company. And then the legitimate company came out, and that's where I had to pay the balance, which was only a few hundred dollars. Hmm. That's all the legitimate company got was that $300. Yeah. Everything else was a scam. They were scammers. So I actually reported this to um, the Eternal General. Of the yeah. state of Ohio? Yes. Okay. 
and of course nothing actually has ever gotten accomplished as a result of that. They did open a case, right? Um, but then magically, the phone number and the business name and the address disappeared. It was no longer posted. Naturally. Um, they did follow up, and it's it was actually a private residence. The people there have no clue what this was about. So all of it was phony. So how is it that they are allowed to get a business um, address posted? That that to me is the yeah. question. Even the business guy told you, remember that? Yeah, the legitimate business yeah. said that this is a big scam. So it's not like this is something that is yeah. new. It, it's known among the businesses, so not just for garage doors, but I'm going to assume for roofing, for a lot of things. So I'm going to give you a short ans answer with respects to time. So, for example, if, if I wanted to start a garage door business tomorrow, I can go to the s state of Ohio, okay, and I could do a name search, and online for $99, I can register an LLC, Limited Liability Corporation and I could pick whatever address I want when I'm filling out the information. Okay, run my credit card, and within five minutes, I get a certificate from the state. Now, the state doesn't vet me. I'm not getting checked. I paid my 99 bucks, and I registered as an LLC under whatever name I choose. So, on the outside, people go, yeah, it seems legitimate. But when I get into the presentation, I'm going to kind of go through some checks and balances of things that you can do. Those things are always unfortunate. And then what's really unfortunate, as we move greater into the area of technology, these things are going to become more of an abundance of a negative impact on consumers thinking they're doing something right and their course of actions are correct, only to find out that they're getting taken. I even took because I am, I try to be smart and right. cognizant. I took a picture of license plate of the car for the guy that came. I provided the phone numbers that I had. Um, but yeah, nothing. No protections at all. No nothing. I know. <laughs> so I want to talk about the Elder Justice Initiative. I'm sorry, you had a question? I think I did the same thing with the state at no cost. Really? Yeah. You got a deal. But I, maybe I did. I don't know. Yeah, because as far as I know, it's $99. It didn't cost me anything. Wow. Wow. You're not a garage door guy, are you? Yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think I found your man. No. Uh. See, you never know what problems you're going to solve in a setting like this. Um, hey, Rick, would you make a call to the Lakeland Police Department, please? Sure. Thanks. Right. We, have, we have a pickup. So what is the Elder Justice Initiative? So about five years ago, um, all branches of law enforcement and government noticed that off the charts increase of elderly people succumbing to scams and frauds. And it wasn't just elderly, but primarily elderly are the target for a number of reasons. A lot of them live alone. Um, a lot of them, their emotions could be tapped easily. They're very trusting. Um, they might not think or ask their qualifying questions that somebody of, of, of younger age might do. So it just seems like they're a pretty soft target. So the proportions got so large that the federal government came out with the Elder Justice Initiative and the budget they set for this was unlimited. Uh, the notice first went out to the FBI um, and they says, we don't care what it takes. We need to get this under control. Uh, they went to the uh, U.S. Department of Justice, had a lot of meetings with U.S. federal prosecutors, and said, whatever it takes to get these guys, we need to get these guys and prosecute them and put them away. So actually, we have a community partnership with the Department of Justice. I work with Brian McDonough, who's a U.S. federal prosecutor, Northeast Ohio District. And I also have, uh, I was fortunate to go through the FBI Citizens Academy last fall, uh, where just everyday people like me can actually participate in nine weeks of uh, going through different training aspects, learning about case studies, how they do it, what they do it, why they do it, uh, with a number of FBI agents at uh, the downtown field office. 
Um, and it's something you have to be referred to them. And then they reach out to you and said that uh, somebody referred you as a possible candidate. They get two, over 200 applications a year and they only take 30. Uh, so I was uh, extremely gratified and humbled to participate in that. Um, and I learned a lot. And I think it was through what we were doing community-wise that allowed me to get the nod that the FBI took me as a, a, a Citizens Academy participant. And it was nine weeks I graduated out of there in November of last year. And now I'm a pretty big player in the Alumni Association. And I, I just want to change subjects a little bit. I know the FBI is getting a really bad rap in the news today. So I have been with these guys. I know their wives. I've met their families. I've met their kids. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, the news only reports all the bad stuff. But uh, as many things that are twisted in our country today, unfortunately, has reached the level of a federal law enforcement agency. And you got a lot of good men and women doing what they're told because they don't, really don't have any recourse not to because that's not a career you just throw to the side. And uh, I can tell you just seeing many of these people in an event I participated in last month where we honored four, 610 fallen heroes at Flags of Honor at Edgewater Park, uh, they're distraught, they're upset. And the Washington Bureau is hammering Christopher Ray that you need to start doing the right thing because the news is killing us. So please don't be too judgmental. Uh, there's a lot of good guys that come into work every day just like a lot of us do if you're still working and you try to do the right thing. But you also got to follow orders. And a lot of them have stepped down and changed careers, but not everybody has the ability to do that. So uh, keep them in your prayers. Hopefully the right decisions are made and it doesn't fall prey to what's Democrat or Republican, but hopefully it falls prey to what's right or what's wrong. And if you're not sure, hopefully common sense will be used. That's how we raised our kids. That's how our parents raised us. And I'd sure like to see that come back into practice. So, um, in the Elder Justice Initiative, some of the things we do, because local law enforcement does not have the resources, so if my next door neighbor, if there was a guy painting house numbers on the curb, and he says, I'm a college student and I'm working and it's $50, I'll paint the house numbers on the curb, and uh, my neighbor says, yeah, okay, I'll do that. And he knocks on the door and says, I'm done. He says, oh, by the way, I had to use a special paint, and so it cost me $100. Well, you know, I didn't want to pay $100, but since you already did it, well, that's, that's a common scam in neighborhoods today, okay, one of the common scams. So my neighbor might call the Mentor Police Department, and this is pretty much all local law enforcement. They're going to take your name, your number, the report. They're going to ask for a description, how much money you were out of pocket, what was the activity that you paid for? And that's going to be the end of it. Not that they want it to be the end of it, but they just do not have the resources or the manpower. So I've done a number of speaking engagements with Lake County uh, Chief of Police, uh, monthly luncheons, and Lake County Sheriff's Department, because what we can do is uh, we can bring in the resources of the FBI. And we can also bring in Brian McDonough, the U.S. Federal Prosecutor, which we work with. And here's the key component. You have a 72-hour window to catch the guy to get your money. And once that 72-hour window is passed, you can still catch the bad guy, but you're probably never going to see your money because it's already down the pipeline and it's, I mean, I could tell you stories, uh, the Russian mafia has a pretty big presence in Cleveland over the years. And they owned a number of hotels and city buildings. And the FBI had been literally watching them, wiretapping, bouncing uh, things off cell phone towers to try to get locations with fencing technology. And they finally got on the trail of millions and millions of dollars. So imagine this, in seven minutes, in seven minutes, 
they were able to transfer $30 million three different places in seven minutes. Now you try to, now you try to even when you're on the trail and you're hunting, okay, I mean, it's gonna be pretty tough to grab them. So this is a complex problem that has layers upon layers upon layers. Um, this is not the one or two college students in a one bedroom apartment on their computer and they're really good and they can hack anything no matter how many firewalls you have or whatever, whatever, and they're gonna get your banking info. These are now corporate entities. I've been with the US Inspector Attorney General for the US, I've been with the US Inspector General for the state of Ohio with mail. I've, sat, I've, I've been to sitting in with heads from the Federal Trade Commission, and as I mentioned, the FBI and you know, now my close friend Brian McDonough, the U.S. federal prosecutor. Imagine a room this big with 100 cubicles, and every cubicle, there's a person dialing. And maybe this 10 cubicles in this section, this is what they do. They read the obituaries every day, and they say, hmm, 75, deceased spouse, no children target because he has no recourse that individual that person so who knows what they're going to set him up with okay as crazy it sounds I mean you I mean I know that Dr. Phil ran a lot of these specials where these um, romantic engagements where where women or men are sending somebody overseas money to come abroad to meet them uh, oh, something happened at the airport at the uh, airport, I need another 5,000, and people send money and send money and send money. Always keep in mind, if you ever fall victim to this, that 72-hour window is critical. So you're going to see, uh, I think my contact information was on the first slide. Yeah, you can take down this number, which is a voicemail for me, and if anybody watching this feels that they've been a victim, um, by all means, contact me. Um, you can also go to the website, uh, wisdomcollaborative.net. There's a comment section. I'll get it. Um, and then what we'll do is I'll, I'll call you back. I'll get in touch with you. Um, I'll contact spe the special agent at the FBI. And depending on the time that's lapped, uh, there could be something we do. and. There could be something that we can't do. But even if, it, if time has gone by where they don't feel that they can do anything, all of these things go into a database. So depending on if it was a phone call you got, if it came up on caller ID, make sure you have the number. You took pictures of license plates, trucks, all of that's information that goes into a big database where at some point in time, that thief might rear his ugly head again, or that phone number shows up again and they can track it. Um, I, I worked with a lady here in Ohio. They tracked the phone number to New York um, and they just missed the guy by minutes. Okay, so there still is opportunity. I know the loss of money hurts, but um, ultimately, hopefully we get that. We were able to have Two arrests here in Lake County a few years back, one in the city of East Lake and the other in the city of Kirtland. Um, they were prosecuted and we had two bad guys sitting 20 to 30 years in federal prison. Uh, and it was all elderly scams. One guy was posing as a New York life insurance agent and uh, he convinced multiple people to write their insurance premium checks to him instead of the company. Um, and then the other one had to do with gift cards with the city of East Lake, and uh, that couple got taken for about twenty-five thousand dollars. But uh, they didn't get their money. But we caught the bad guy. Okay, so uh, just a couple of statistics. You can see back in two thousand and fourteen, it was two two point six million people over sixty-five were victims of identity theft. Well, you can see in this chart kind of like where we're going to. I mean, we're gonna, we're gonna hit 90 million. 
I mean, you're talking about close to a third of the population of the country. That's serious. And I'll tell you, it is in the billions every year. This is in a multi-million, this is a multi-billion dollar operation. I mean, these guys are well organized, mm -hmm. extremely well organized, and they know what they're doing. Um, what do you think promoted that in such an increase so quick? Do you think it's because of the internet? Do you just think because there's more elderly people? Or? Well, it's both. So obviously the elderly population in the United States, the baby boomer generation, they're all getting to a point where they're moving on. Uh, some have lost their spouse. Uh, if they had children, they might be deceased or they might have never had children. So the way the criminal element works, it's an opportunity. You know, uh, I don't want to go to work. I could make tens of thousands or millions uh, doing different things. And if you're really good on a computer um, and that's your course of action that you choose on how to make your living, that's where we're at. I mean, I think technology is great, but uh, obviously the advancement of technology has led to these types of opportunities to just take money out of your bank, uh, scam you, trick you, click a link, whatever the case may be. So we can get it through the mail. Um, I could tell you a dozen stories of people that got something in the mail and it said to call this 800 number, you've been selected and they called. And they said that there was a processing fee and to pay the $25 processing fee, okay, you'll be awarded $10,000. And what you're gonna do is you make sure you enter your email because we're gonna give you a code for your prize award by email and you tell us where to send the money. Well, how you just mailed this to me? How, what do you mean you don't know where to send the money? But see, people are so wrapped up in, I'm gonna win $10,000 or whatever. And these things look very legitimate. They look very real, okay? So what happens is, is people get scammed. Sometimes they ask for banking information, routing number, account number, and you would think that people would not do that but people get so into the emotion of whatever it is they think they're gonna win, they will almost do whatever to get the money. And depending on, you know, right now, a lot of people are in desperate times. And the, and the crooks know that. So the more desperation there is, the easier it is to click the link, the easier it is to answer the phone with the wrong answer, the easier it is, is to open that uh, physical mail and call the 800 number because people are desperate. And depending on the type of desperation, some people will do almost anything. So one of the things, and I've done presentations like this uh, to individuals that um, kind of take care of mom and dad a little bit more. And it's good information that the siblings know so they can recognize anything that might be going kind of sideways with mom and dad's bank account. So um, when you respond to one of these through mail, on the computer, on the phone, I mean, there's even bad ads on TV or the radio, okay? Um, or in person, if they're knocking door to door in the community. What happens is, is you get what's referred to as a sucker's list. So these are lists like anything else where people compile lists of, Dale bought this off of my pillow guy. He just bought his new slippers. So everybody that bought from a TV ad, there's, there's an aggregate list. There's an aggregate list for everything. I can't tell you how many of our names, addresses, emails, and phone numbers are on a list dealing with something somewhere. And those lists are sold over and over and over again. So depending on what your type of business is or your criminal activity, you're gonna buy a list that's gonna target a certain category of people that's gonna make what you do easy. So mail, computer, phone, TV, radio, in person, 
we have to be so conscientious of what's around the corner. Um, I don't even know if I can emphasize that enough. But there's general things. I mean, Amazon's never going to call you. PayPal's never going to call you, okay? The IRS is never going to call you. The Social Security Department is never going to call you, okay? So you have to be aware of that. I mean, tax season's coming up. I guarantee you that there's going to be phone calls, and it's probably going to be a recorded message that there's something wrong with your taxes, and you need to call this number um, to avoid all penalties and fines associated with your account. But they don't call. That's a scam. I'm going to, I'm going to give you a scenario. We go, into, we, 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 we go to a house in the suburb outside of Cleveland. Dining room table. Mailing envelope after envelope after envelope. Six inches high from end to end, the whole dining room table. And it was all scam mail. And this lady's going through them, opening, and she's trying to find the biggest bang for her buck mm -hmm. as to what contest she won. And you have the postal inspector from the state of Ohio. You have a federal FBI agent. And you have the local law enforcement at her house telling her this is a result of you participating in something in the past that has created this now, your present and future. Because he says, once you get on these lists, it's next to impossible to get off. These mailings, and in the meantime, the phone, the phone within an hour's time rang seven times because they're also hitting her telephone. So this lady's on the list, and they're hammering her. And this just goes on and on and on. So the common sense thing, when does it kick in? For some, it just doesn't. So, I mean, some of the mail scams, you won the lottery, you won a prize, you may receive a check, you won money. Fake charities asking for money. I mean, Christmas is coming. A lot of us are going to get calls about donating. You know, one of the first things I ask is, you have a website you can reference your charity to. How much goes to the organization? How much goes to the person I'm talking on the phone? Uh, you're more than welcome to call me back after I've checked you out. They're never going to call you back. Not to say they're not legitimate, but they're just calling and calling and calling and calling and calling. So if we ever had to do due diligence and be careful, we just have to do 10 times more today because... We're getting hit in all different directions. And this is a multi-billion with a B dollar business for these, these thugs. The, the problems facing legitimacy is this. They're, I, don't, I don't think I have to tell anybody in, the, in a room that there's just not enough people to fill jobs. So in order to have really good legitimacy, there has to be a certain foundational structure put into what's going on in an organization or the veterans or the police or the fire or whatever and they just don't have the resources or the bodies to do it so what they do is they do the best they can if you're uncertain on the phone don't feel pressured say I'm more than glad to see if my donations can be extended to your organization feel free to send me something in the mail so how many people have a habit of using their debit card from their bank. How many people use a debit card? A debit. debit card. Oh, of course. Okay. <laughs> the worst thing you can do in the world is use a debit card for any type of transaction other than if you're going to go to... Do you use it as credit then? If you say it's credit, it's the same. money back if you charge it too. Don't. So that debit's even worse. Don't, don't use a debit card, use a credit card. When an aggregator compiles whatever information, and they might be compiling a database of information of anybody between the age of 35 and 50 that bought a Lexus SUV through the years of 2000 and 2022. Sounds legitimate. Guy doesn't have a criminal record, you know, no warrants against him, yeah, okay. You know, he's, he's an honest businessman. Yes, they are, but there's so much out there. It's, 
It's like an army of thieves in a thousand categories that they're trying to rein all this in. That's why when they brought the Elder Justice Initiative into the picture five years ago, the federal government said, I want you to watch how you spend, but you do not have a budget. We got to rein this in. So it's like anything else. It be, it's so massive, they're struggling with it, but a lot of bad guys have been taken off the street. Uh, some of the criminal companies that are facilitating these processes are no longer doing that. But it's like any other crime element, it's, it's hard to totally wipe it off the map. I want to get back to the debit card. Here's the reason you don't want to use debit cards. Debit cards are tied to your bank account. So if, if, you, if that debit card gets hacked, they can drain your bank account. Well, my husband just had it happen to him. So he's used his debit card, you know, because we can't even pull over spend on a credit card, you know, and we go, oh, where did all this money go? But anyway, he he got hit for from one eight hundred. It said it was from one eight hundred contacts for over twelve hundred dollars yeah. on his debit card, and he's like, ah, no. Right. <laughs> now with a with a credit card. You got a little more recourse with MasterCard or Visa. But he's, yeah, he's out of the money. I mean, he did get it resolved through his bank eventually. You know, they were able to, you know, when the fraud department came in. This and, and that depends on the policy at the bank. Not all people get their money back, yeah. you know. Some banks are more, are more forgiving than others. So, um, you know, especially like gasoline and stuff. Um, if you ever, if, if you use a debit card, even a credit card, I, when, I never scan my credit card at the pump. So if you ever see, a, when next time you go to a gas station, just kind of look around, and if there's a white van anywhere close, what they're doing is, through their technology, they're trying to pick up the numbers on your card that you're swiping at the pump. And that's how they do it. And it's going into a database, they've got a laptop in their van, and they're just feeding numbers. This is where you go to one of these kiosks or something? And, and so no, you might just go to Speedway right up here. And over in Sheets, I see a white van parked. And I'm not saying they're all white, but I'm just saying is that's one of the common traits. If, if, if you've seen a van parked somewhere, and let, let's just may, maybe it's been parked there for a while, um, it could be that they're basically... Uh, grabbing the numbers as you swipe your credit card at that pump. There, there's technology where if, if we were going side by side down Mentor Avenue, I could have a mic about the size of this pop bottle and direct it at the window, and anything you say, I could record you in my car. Well, if you're in the, the, newer, the newer gas stations that have the chip yeah, with it, that's not transmitting their card number. That when you have when you're using the chip, it's just transmitting an encryption code back and forth. So that would not be readable. Mm -hmm. But on the on some of the some of the stations as they've been converting them over the last year or two to the chip readers, I do the the tap. You know where where when you're he's, the way that they're <coughs> getting it the other way is when you're actually pushing your card in and inserting the card into the reader. Thing. But with a chip reader, it's, it, that's only transmitting encrypted, so that's not able to be picked up. But not all of the gas stations have converted, so it depends on... So it's good to have the chip. It's good to have, okay, yes. It's I'm good to have the chip. But yes. And if you have the chip and you have where you can tap it, that's, that's your tap it. Do, doesn't the credit card company stand behind a fraudulent sale? Well, every, every credit card company has a fraud department. Has, has a fraud department. Yeah. So if, if, if you look at your credit card statement and you say, I didn't make that charge, you're going to call the bank associated with that card and they're going to direct you to the fraud department. You're going to get on the phone. They're going to give you a case number. Okay? And then what they're going to do is they're going to research that, which is probably going to take 7 to 14 business days. Aren't they required by law? investigate and give your money back? Well, they're, they're going to they're gonna invest, investigate, and then what you're going to have to do is 
they're going to they're going to tell you they're they're going to terminate that credit card account and they'll issue you a new card. So then now you've got seven to fourteen days to wait for that new card to come. <laughs> yeah, in, in, unless you want to get it express shipped and and pay the twenty five bucks and you'll have it in two days. I mean, I can't emphasize enough, this is why at the federal level they came out with this elder justice initiative to try to bring some level of resolve to all of the stuff that's going on, but it's, it, it's so vast, it's so big, it's so large, um, and, and I'm sure they do the best they can. But like I said, local law enforcement literally has, outside of taking a report and acknowledging what happened based on th what you're telling them, they, they got no resources to pursue the individual, to pursue your money or whatever, and that's where we're an intermediary to try to facilitate that, to work with you, to work with local law enforcement, to say, okay, now you've got a person in the FBI, you got a U.S. federal prosecutor that you can call and hand this off to, and they'll take it from there, rather than just have the report collect dust or, or, or go into a filing cabinet. So I do these to groups like this. I do them to church groups uh, because we're trying to get the word out there. We're trying to get people to become more aware of what's going on and what to stay away from. But many hands make light work, and there's not too many hands doing it. I mean, it's a, it's a beautiful day. I could tell you about 10 other things I could be doing right now. But this means a lot to me. And the information, getting it to all of you that were kind and generous to come today, and listen to the presentation, I just feel that this is my place right now. So, uh, computers, uh, on the phone rather. Again, IRS is never gonna call you. Um, if you get a fake call, f you know, where it's called a grandparent scam, grandchild, nephew, niece, saying they're in trouble, they need money. Telemarketers don't follow high pressure tactics or scare tactics. Um, they're not gonna be able to uh, reach any of your other grandchildren. Uh, TV or radio, products with large sh shipping or handling charges, uh, products sold that are frequently fake. So even if you're looking at an infomercial, um, it'll probably air another 300 times. So just go do your due diligence on the product and the company. Uh, and fraudulent mortgage ads. Door to door, in person, door to door repairs or sales, garage doors. Um, I mean, there's a lot of family issues that are going on with, you know, siblings are always not the most honest or eth ethical, and they're doing things. And I had a personal experience in my own family with this, uh, and I only found out after the fact. And it happened, and it was too late to do anything about it. Um, but even attorneys, uh, medical caregivers, any type of transaction using a credit card uh, or check fraud. Okay, so some of the things that you might want to look at is um, if any of your loved ones look like they might be uh, suffering you know, emotionally with something. So only one in 50 cases are reported. So why is that? I mean, I just got scammed out of 10 grand. Why wouldn't I report this? Well, they're a little embarrassed. They don't want to share it with their son or their daughter or even maybe their spouse if he's living or she's living. So they're embarrassed and they'd rather just sweep it away and say, okay, well, I learned a lesson. It won't happen again. And, and nobody knows. So another thing, uh, and that's why I ask if, if anybody's been a victim, is because we want to let people know there's a very easy and friendly path towards hopefully resolving the issue of a financial loss and putting the bad guy away. But again, we have a 72 hour window. And once that window's expired, it's gonna be really tough, slim to none, that we're gonna catch him or get your money. Any questions up to this point? Who do we contact in that 72 hours? Because I contact the Attorney General's office, and that's it for Ed Burr. Okay, well, I, I think that was good that you did that. What city do you live in? Uh, Paintsville. Okay, so I, I would have contacted... Uh, uh, Adult yeah, Adult Protective Services. Thank you, Dan. Um, law enforcement. 
again, if you take in my, my name and number, I mean, put me on the list too, okay? Because I'm more than happy to talk with you and then I'll identify who did you talk to, where did you go, who has knowledge of this, and then depending on the time that's lapsed, um, I could call Brian McDonough, the U.S. federal prosecutor, or Mylon Kasanovich at the FBI Cleveland Field Office and ask him to see if there's anything that could be done. So there's two resources over and above what we just talked to that, and, 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 the, and the more things we can put in the pipeline to get the bad guy, I mean, the more chances we have of, of catching them. Do other counties have something similar to as your group? Other counties? Yeah. Cuyahoga County does. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, they've got a pretty big group. You collaborate with them, I'm assuming? Occasionally. Yeah, I mean, they've put, uh, they've got more informational material. Uh, they've got little uh, flyers that uh, they do as well. Um, but I'll have a, a number of resources you can go to as we get uh, closer. Some of the signs, you know, unpaid bills, large amount of junk mail, as I mentioned, sizable bank withdrawals for unusual credit card activity, uh, caregiver family not providing for older adults, changes in personality, demeanor, hygiene, or self-care, uh, missing valuables, unusual new friends, new names on accounts, and if the phone rings constantly. Those are all red flags that there's probably something going on and it's probably not gonna be good. Um, if there's any uh, unusual changes in a will or beneficiary, uh, social isolation, uh, calls from debt collectors, strange charges on medical bills, uh, home in a state of disrepair. I mean, these are all kind of like red flags that uh, something's going on, and I'm sure that you're going to know if you might be caring for an elderly parent uh, where things just don't seem to be adding up. Um, why target older adults? That's where the money is. If retired, often at home and accessible. Older adults with memory problems are a particularly attractive target and older adults might be more trusting, which is a few things we kind of went through earlier on in the presentation. So if you're older, I guess it's just not good to be trusting and kind of like caring and a nice person and all that other stuff. We just I guess have to be more like the devil. Distrusting, unfortunately. So I, get, I guess we, we can still be like that, but we got to kind of ramp up the other things we need to check. So what can you do? Uh, safeguard financial information. Safeguard personal information. Uh, you're, you can always order or go online and check your credit reports. Uh, use computer safe practices. So uh, today is Wednesday. So in the last three days, I've gotten six emails from I have no idea, but there's an attachment that says your payment has been processed, yes. waiting for your bank information <laughs> seven in three days, okay? And I use a VPN, okay? If, 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 does everybody know what a VPN is? Oh, yeah. Okay, so it masks your IP address, okay? So like right now, if I was on my laptop, they might think I'm in California, okay, when I'm in Mineral, Ohio. So I've, I've had seven of those in three days. So I don't open, I, I clicked on them. I don't open the attachment. If there's a link, I don't click on the link. And what I do is I use Microsoft Outlook for my email. I report that to Microsoft. Okay, okay? so they have a fraud department that will then look in and will track that email as far as they can. And then they'll go after and hunt the bad guys down. Does Gmail have that? Because a lot of people use Gmail. I would think, I would think they do. Okay. But I, I couldn't speak exactly to the fact if they do or not. If you got this email, yes. why did you open it? I, all I did is uh, when I saw the email, I clicked to open the email. Why? Okay. Why don't you just say 
There's a little button up there that says scam. Hit it and it's gone. Because it's I, I, want, I, I wanted to see if there were any clues as to who it was coming from. How many people do you but, think? But here's, here's, the, the, here, here's the thing though. I did not click the attachment with the email and I did not click the link. All I did was click to open the email to read what the content of the email was. So I guess knowing what I know, if there was, if. How, how does everybody else in the room know that? You're an expert on this. Well, I wouldn't say I'm an expert. I've well, just become. You know more than we do. Yeah. How, you know, how are you supposed to guard against this? By, I, I guess, taking by what I'm saying is, is that don't click links from an unknown sender. And if there's an attachment, as these emails had, do not open the attachments. Because here's, here's what's probably going to happen. If you click the link or you click the attachment to open the attachment in an email, they're going to own your computer. So any information you have on that computer, they're going to have access to. So, okay, if that happens, if, if I made that mistake and all of a sudden my computer looks like somebody else now has access to my computer, what should I do? Pull the plug. Turn it off. Yeah, we, we typically try to train people like, a, first off, any email could be spoofed. So even if you think the email is from something you know, it could potentially just be spoofed. It's super easy to do. But when you look at the email, if, if you're looking and you see, you can always kind of hover over the link to see where it goes. And sometimes you can very easily tell that it's not going to go to the place that you think it's going to go. So typically what I do is if I get any email, if, I, if it's something that I, one, wasn't expecting, I would definitely not click the links. But if it's something that I'm interested in, I will go to Google and find the company and find the thing that they're telling me about. And then I will go through, you know, finding it through the search results in Google instead of getting that from, yeah. from the email itself. If it's you something that I think it's like I want, yeah. I go around the email and, and get back to where I want to go. And that's coming from the head of the IT department here at Lake Lakeville. So good. take that to the <laughs> bank. <laughs> if it's a, if it's an email from a legitimate source and I think that's somebody that I'm doing business with, then I will click the link. But before I click on any link, even from a legitimate source, I look to see what the link says it is. Because if it's not, because even if I think it's from a legitimate source, if that email is spoofed, then they have like the Amazon thing at the top and it says it's from Amazon customer service, but before I click on any of those links, I will look to see where that link is going. You know. the, the, other, the other thing on a, a lot of the accounts, so I'm sure a lot of us buy on Amazon, um, just set up two-step verification. I mean, I can't, most of my accounts now, uh, if they're internet-based or they're Amazon, everything has two-step verification. So, you know, they're gonna send a code to my phone. I have to respond to that for them to assure that yes, it is Dale Stefancic making this purchase. So that's another measure you can take. And, and I'll tell you, if hit and delete on the email works for you, then I'll tell you, just keep doing that. You know, and you won't, you won't have any problems. Me, I'm a little more inquisitive. That's all. But some of the other things we can do is that, you know, monthly, make sure you check your, all your financial statements, okay? Um, Check out the repair person you hire, get three estimates. Don't sign a contract you have verified the company. If you don't understand a financial transaction or you feel you are being pressured to give money or to sign a document, ask for help. So, you know, um, and the other thing I would add to that is that uh, any good contractor, if he's going door to door, will have with him a copy of his general liability insurance and a copy of his paid workman's compensation. If he doesn't have that, say, well, um, if you want an opportunity to earn my business, when you have those documents, you're more than, feel free to come back. Um, 
Some other things we can do, uh, stop payment on, on any money wires or checks if you've already started a transaction like that. Uh, you can place a fraud alert on a three credit reporting agency numbers. You can change your phone number. You can freeze your credit, shred old credit cards. Contact your bank or your credit companies. I will tell you that mine, my wife's, and all my kids who turned on the credit freeze. Mm -hmm. And basically all three of them, you know, will let you use an app. And if I need to get a loan for a car or a loan for whatever, I find out who they use to pull my credit. I unfreeze my credit for the day. I let them pull my info and then they freeze it back. That way no one's getting out fraudulent loans and that your name, I, I highly recommend. Yeah, I think you, that with the credit reporting, thanks for that, Rick, you, with the agencies you have, you can tell them I want to put a 12 hour or a 24 hour, I want to take the freeze off because I'm buying a new house, I'm buying a vehicle, um, and they're going to want to pull my credit history. And then once that time has elapsed, they'll automatically put the freeze back on your credit. And I, I let... Uh, the car dealership know, hey, if you're going to pull my credit, you got 24 hours to do so. That's how long the I'm taking the freeze off. If it's past 24 hours, you're going to have to call me back. So I think there's a fair amount of control we can exercise over keeping the risk of these unfortunate types of activities happening. Uh, we just have to be a little more diligent, and we have to be aware and know that don't be in a hurry. You know, the contractor will call back tomorrow. He'll come back tomorrow. Um, all these things can happen in time. Just don't feel pressured into making a, a bad mistake. So uh, other ways we can get involved. Um, we can call law enforcement, make a report. We've gone over that. Um, if you're getting the type of pressure where you think you'd have to actually go and file a restraining order to court, there's a number of crisis hotlines here in Lake County, uh, Adult Protective Services that Dan Troy mentioned. Um, there'll be a list of a number of governmental agencies. There's always legal counsel, although that's going to incur an expense. And you can go to the elderjustice.gov website, and there is a litany of uh, resources there. Um, the FTC, so here's some helpful resources. Um, there is just a ton. If it's something that happened through the mail, obviously you want to call the U.S. Postal Inspector Service. Uh, the Federal Trade Commission handles just about all the above. Um, I would first look to call local agencies here in Lake County before I would start to use the federal uh, assets that we have in place because I think you'll get a little quicker response. Um, and again, if, if you don't feel that uh, you're being heard or your concern's not being recognized, you can always reach out to myself and I'll see what I can do for you. And I'll tell you who has great information right at the top of the list here, and they're really on top of just about every scam going on in, in the country today is ARP. I mean, you can go to their website, which is updated frequently with the latest and greatest con game going on, as well as the list of any, any, any of the type of fraudulent activity that's going on in the country. So ARP is a good one. And I think that's, oh, and this is where a lot of this information was obtained from. But that's all I have, folks. So... Uh, I'm glad to take any other questions or, yes, sir, Dan. Yeah, just to, uh, as Dana was said, uh, the problem with these crimes is so few of them are reported. Uh, you know, one out of 44 and all that. Uh, it's, it's, it's really a preventable crime, uh, but it's all about education. As he said, you know, seniors, we tend to be polite. We don't hang up on people when we should. And, uh, but some of the things we're trying to do in Columbus, uh, uh, you know, I've been recently appointed to Ohio's Elder Abuse Commission, which is underneath the Attorney General's office. And, uh, you know, it's 
basically ramping up that this is not just about physical or mental abuse, this is financial right. manipulation, you know, trying to address those particular issues. So Does everybody know Dan Troy, our state rep? Yeah. yeah. Okay. That you know me at Lakeland. <laughs> <laughs> And um, he's, he's, he's part of our organization, yeah. so. Yeah, I've done a couple of these, I did a couple of these and then the pandemic hit, so we had to kind right. of shut those down. And, uh, but uh, and yeah, we, we, you know, one of the things I think Dale mentioned is you get these phone calls and they're like 255 numbers or 944 numbers or uh, 943 and you think it's a local call right. and, and they're really not. So I, I am co-sponsoring a piece of legislation one of my, co one of my uh, colleagues has introduced to try and you know, require that, uh, you know, these phony local phone numbers cannot be used by these people. But, you know, this is an international thing, uh, and so it's real tough to rein in some of this stuff. But uh, also a bill in which I think is going to move in December that, uh, uh, because we need these things reported, and there are certain people who are required to report any type of elder abuse, just as there is for child abuse, teachers and things like that. So. Uh, what this will do is increase the penalty for those who fail to report elder abuse because we need we need to have this reported in as many cases as possible to address it. And uh, again, uh, you know, it's just it's just trying to educate our for, you know the, the, the child scams. You know, you'll get these people, these 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 elderly women will get a call and it'll be a very grainy voice and say, uh, "This is your grandson. I'm down here in Texas." And right away she'll say. Oh, Randy, is that you? And then right away, then he knows he's Randy. Right. And, uh, you know, please send money. I'm in trouble and stuff right. like that. And, you know, I've seen some of that in my own family. Uh, you know, where, uh, you know, my you know, my mother being manipulated by, by a sibling for uh, uh, the fact that uh, her daughter needs more money for her tuition and all that, you know. So right. the tendency is, is, is seniors, we tend to be a soft touch. And uh, so, uh, but we really need to see all these warning signs that Dale has pointed out and uh, uh, really, really try to educate uh, folks as, as much as possible. In other words, let them know that if it's too good. I mean, I just looked at my email here today. I got something from Atlanta, Hartfield Jackson Airport. They said they found an ATM card that my name is worth $5.5 million in that account. <laughs> And if I just sent three hundred ninety-five dollars to to for the clearance permit to let that be released to me, uh, uh, I'm going to be uh, on easy street. So you can you can give up politics, Dan. Well, that's <laughs> true. well although no, even if no, you did get the five million, I'll I don't think you're right. I'll never do, yeah. do that. I'm, I'm I know, just, even with the five I, million, I just, you know. It, I like it. people say, why are you still doing this? I say, it keeps me off the streets. Yeah. So, <laughs> well, we appreciate all your work yeah, down at the State House. And thank you for the, you know, I'm, I'm part of the Wisdom Collaborative, too, and, and we're working on some of these very important issues, and this was the first one we took, and, uh, uh, you know, it, it's ongoing, and, uh, but, but there's a lot of, more, a lot more awareness of it. We just need to educate the folks out there how to avoid these things. If you don't recognize the number, don't answer the phone. If right. it's important, they'll leave you a message. And, and, and if, if you belong to a, a certain church or congregation and you want us to come and do a presentation, we're more than happy to do that. Um, you know, again, we're just trying to get the word out and we're trying to eliminate the possibilities of people falling prey to this, you know, criminal activity. Um, and, and hopefully we get enough people educated to where they're not a victim, but they had the awareness and they made the right decision instead of the wrong decision. So, anything else? Unfortunately, because you know America is the land of the free, and we have so much opportunity to, you know, open up a business, uh, create an account, uh, do activity. Some people have taken the liberties and the freedoms that. Uh, so many before us have sacrificed their lives for and they've used it in the wrong way. And then a lot of us have become victims of that wrong way. So all we can try to do as people in the community is try to counter that activity the best we can. And the best way we have found out is to educate as many people as we can get in front of. This has been the Knowledge Exchange, a Lakeland Community College production. 